Good evening. Rabbi Arthur Waskow, director of the Shalom Center, is involved in many interreligious projects that address issues of peace and social justice, the environment, and community building. He is recognized as a writer and teacher of Jewish history and theology, and a leader in the movement for Jewish renewal. In 2007, Newsweek magazine named him one of the 50 most influential, influential American rabbis. For 14 years, Rabbi Waskow was a resident fellow of the Institute for Policy Studies, a center for independent analysis of governmental policy and social change. He is the author um, or editor of over two dozen books, including God Wrestling, Down to Earth, Judaism, and most recently, The Tent of Abraham, Stories of Hope and Peace for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. So please join me in welcoming Rabbi Arthur Waskow. So this thing was booming, I hope it isn't too loud, but let me greet you with Shalom and Salam, Peace. So why did I start that way? Well, I started that way because for centuries, the three communities of which those are the internal words of greeting and blessing have said them internally but not with each other and we now live in a world in which I think it's really crucial for us to begin learning that even if there happen to be in a single room only Jews or only Christians or only Muslims or only any combination of two of those in fact in every room we sit in are all three of those communities and other communities on the planet besides. But the major focus I want to lift up this evening is about those three families of Abraham, uh, which at this moment of history are partly able to greet each other in the way I did and partly at each other's throats. And I want to talk about both those realities in our world and about how to walk the path that's more likely to be the one in which people can exchange the greetings of shalom and salam and peace rather than undertaking what would be the second most disastrous possible future for the human race over the next century, a war between what calls itself the West and Islam. I said the second most disastrous possibility. The first one is an out of control climate crisis. Uh, the one I call not global warming, which seems to me at some profound level, warming has to feel comfortable and comforting. I call it global scorching instead, which I think is more honest to the reality and less likely to lull people, even the ones who say global warming, it's a danger, we have to do something about it. Something at the unconscious level about calling it global warming, I think, calms people. Not terrible to be calm about addressing it, but to be clear and truthful about the danger. So I could, if I had you know, the next several days to be able to be in Iowa, address the other one as well. And I actually will be talking a little bit about it because one of the ways in which the Abrahamic families might in fact work together rather than tearing at each other's guts would be to work together on this danger that we all share. So the title tonight talks about religious upheaval and the issues it raises for us in the problems and possibilities and attractions of peacemaking. So let me begin with some very broad brushstrokes about religious upheaval. There have been several occasions in the history of the human race in which there have been 
profound religious transformations. One of those was what happened when a very loose gaggle of Western Semitic communities living on or near the edge of the Mediterranean Sea were confronted with the imperial power of Sumeria and Egypt, uh, both of them having developed uh, monocrop irrigation agriculture. Very efficient stuff. Produce lots more food and therefore lots more people and therefore <coughs> because irrigation canals you had to really establish control and ownership of once you'd taken the trouble to build a whole network of irrigation canals you were not about to walk away from them. You protected them with an army and you invented notions of ownership. Now, this bunch of Western Semitic small farmers on rocky hillsides, shepherds, orchard keepers, that wasn't their way of life. Ownership was not a big thing. In fact, if you were a shepherd, it was clearly crucial to be able to walk away with one meadow and go to another one. You didn't want to overeat the meadow that was feeding your sheep. What to do if that was the way you were living and these great empires began encroaching not only on your territory but among your minds, your culture, with their new efficiency. Well out of that, and I recommend to you an extraordinary book called The, the Ecology of Eden by Evan Eisenberg, out of that, some contemporary scholars think, arose what we know as Biblical Israel. Some of those Western Semitic farmers and shepherds responded not by surrendering to monocrop imperial irrigation agriculture, but also not by rejecting it out of hand, because it worked too well. But instead, by absorbing some of it and transforming their own culture so as to continue to insist on the deep reality that they didn't own the land, the earth. And so you get the Torah, which not only has Shabbat, the Sabbath, the sense that every seventh day nobody was in charge of the earth and nobody was in charge of each other, and that the seventh year, perhaps even more important, the earth was not made to work, and human beings abandoned their own hierarchy. That teaching, not accidentally, Leviticus 25, is followed in Leviticus 26 with a discussion of what happens if you don't let the earth rest. And what Torah says is, oh, the earth gets to rest anyway on your head through famine, through drought, through exile. The resting is like the law of gravity. The Torah didn't need to teach people the law of gravity because it only took three seconds to discover that if you walk off a height too high, you were going to go squish at the bottom. This teaching took generations to absorb, to learn through experience. So it was important to encode it into the teaching of the future. So out of this rhythm of a great leap forward in control over the earth and over human beings came a new form of community and a new kind of spirituality. Fine. About 1,500 years later comes another great leap forward in control of the earth and control of human beings in the form of Hellenization and the Roman Empire. And biblical Israel, along with all the other indigenous communities of the Mediterranean basin, are overwhelmed, subverted, in the mind, in the economy, in the relationship with the earth, 
in their military capability, in their politics, by the Roman Empire. And that biblical model, which had emerged out of collision and dance with the great Sumerian and Egyptian empires, collapsed in the face of the Roman Empire. Out of that came several centuries of struggle, questioning, crisis, uncertainty, all sorts of different attempts to figure out what to do next. And the resolution of that crisis after several centuries was the emergence of two new forms of community. One, rabbinic Judaism, quite different from biblical Judaism, based not on connecting with God through food and the earth, which is what biblical Judaism was based on. i can come back to that in a minute. But based on connecting with God through words. Words of prayer, words of interpretation of Torah, and its new sister religion, Christianity, which also emerged out of a reinterpretation of the Hebrew Bible, both of them in some kind of awkward relationship with, Helen, with Hellenism. And for the last 2,000 years, and then with the similar emergence of Islam, somewhat further to the east, as that crisis met the indigenous communities of the Arabian Peninsula, the emergence of another new form of community. Here we are, and I think the same process with somewhat different actors is taking place again. This time, modernity stands in the place of the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago, the Egyptian and Sumerian empires of 3,000 years ago or thereabouts. And modernity has shattered all the great traditional cultures, religions of the planet, as Rome did the traditions of the Mediterranean basin. And we are all now in a time of religious upheaval, trying to cope with the impact of modernity. And there have been a number of different responses. One is, hey, join up. This stuff is so efficient. It makes more food, makes more use of things like coal and oil, produces lots more human beings, deals in new ways, often very effective, with disease, also kills off lots more people in wars, also shatters not only cultural communities, but the family forms that had emerged over those last 2,000 years. So it brings both with it, it brings enormous change. Change so deep that by now, our generation, it feels like the entire structure of the world is in an earthquake. Our relationship with the earth in a crisis deeper than anything since before the emergence of the human race. The number of species deaths unheard of since 65 million years ago before there was a human race when the great meteor hit the planet. This time, the great meteor is us. So an extraordinary crisis at that level. And going along with it, new shapes of everybody's economics, globalization, distorting, sometimes shattering the local economies, even of continental superstates like the United States, 
read the daily headlines of the last month and a half. Polities and the nature of politics transformed. Military structures culminating in the H-bomb. All of these unheard of. They may echo what I described before about the triumph of Rome and the triumph of Sumeria and the responses of creating new forms of community. But they stand almost off the scale compared to them. They echo the processes, but at much more intense levels. So, what kind of response? What do we do? Some people sign up. Modernity is great. Some people say, in the midst of an earthquake, what I need to do is to find and hang on to something immovable. And maybe I can find that in the 17th century or 18th century version of my own tradition. And there's a third response, which I'll come to in a moment. The second response looks as if it is connecting with a kind of photograph we have in our minds of the past. We think we know what 17th century Judaism or Islam or Christianity more or less looked like. And some people want to restore it. Now, that raises some interesting problems. Just to take a kind of specific, very vivid, specific from my own tradition, two centuries ago, one century ago, even 50 years ago, there was no question about women praying at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. If they did, they did it in very quiet, unobtrusive ways. Now, you've got to beat women up to keep them from being obtrusive and public and out loud. Once the genie gets out of the bottle, it takes a lot more coercion to make the genie go back in the bottle than to keep the genie in the bottle in the first place. Women are out of the bottle in all the religious traditions. The notion that other traditions have truth value in them, not merely that an occasional extraordinary weird saint emerges in one tradition or another, but that the others have really serious religious truth within them. That notion is out of the bottle. Modernity threw us into connection with each other, sometimes in disastrous ways and sometimes in communicative ways. For example, about 15 years ago, the Dalai Lama, in exile in India, decided he wanted to meet with a bunch of rabbis and other Jewish teachers. Unprecedented. No Dalai Lama had ever thought it was useful to talk to anybody who wasn't a Tibetan Buddhist, because Tibetan Buddhism had the deep truth, and why bother talking to anybody else? Well, the Dalai Lama figured out that it was likely that Tibetan Buddhism might not be able ever to reestablish its sacred connection with its sacred land. And he asked the question, I wonder if there's any community around that might have some experience about what to do if they lose connection with their sacred land. And what do you know? He said, huh, maybe the Jews have some experience to teach about how to deal with this. So he reached out and invited a dozen rabbis and other Jewish teachers to meet with him to talk about this question. There's a book called The Jew in the Lotus that you might want to look at for a description of, this, of that meeting. It turned out the Jews were very interested in learning the Dalai Lama's understanding of meditation. It wasn't the Jews had never meditated, but in modern times, modernity had sort of squashed 
the whole tradition of Jewish meditation. So the two of them learned from each other. A century ago, those rabbis almost certainly would have said, Talk to the Dalai Lama? Why? These guys are obviously the idolaters. They bow down to a statue of a laughing fat man. An image, by the way, that you know, seems okay to me. The one of the old guy in the sky with a long white beard, that seems like a good religious image to me. And so does the laughing fat man. But suddenly these two traditions, which could never have talked to each other, were both enabled and, in a sense, almost forced to talk to each other, given the conditions of the two of them, in the world of modernity. Well, where are we in this process of religious transformation? On the one hand, we have what I call the attempt to find this immovable thing to hang on to. And that has become what many of us call the religious right. I understand it. I even have compassion for it, although I deeply disagree with it. I understand why, if you are living in an earthquake, you might desperately search for something solid to hang on to. Is there any alternative? Well, I call the alternative learning to dance in God's earthquake. It is very hard to dance in an earthquake. Even if you knew how to dance before, none of the dance steps work in the middle of the earthquake. You have to learn some new dance steps. As hard as it is, it seems to me that is the more life-giving way forward. It's what Martin Luther King and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel and Malcolm X, especially in the last year or two of his life, were learning to try to do. So Heschel, an Eastern European Hasidic Jew who gets by the skin of his teeth to America, just barely escaping the Nazi Holocaust, marches alongside of Martin Luther King in some Alabama for voting rights, comes back and says, I felt as if my legs were praying. Now, for a mystical Eastern European chassid, it was always clear your legs could pray, but they would pray by dancing, physically dancing, and dancing a rather restricted dance at that. Certainly not modern, you know, improvisational dance. But the notion that your legs could dance by marching alongside a black Southern Baptist preacher, absurd. Not absurd to Abraham Joshua Heschel. He learned to dance Hasidism in a very new way, in the midst of an earthquake. And King, the southern black preachers of a hundred years had kept their heads down, had protected their churches as well as you could in the midst of the Klan, in the midst of segregation, in the midst of racism and oppression. But King and other southern black ministers began learning to dance Christianity in an earthquake with new dance steps. And so did Malcolm, first in a black-oriented version, subversion, inversion, some would have said, and some did say, perversion of Islam. And then, even when through his pilgrimage to Mecca, he relearned the rainbow coloring of Islam, still was dancing it until he was killed in new dance steps. We're in the moment 
of the re-emergence of what that generation was trying to do, which got submerged in what happened in American society. And the shaking of such deep, uh, such depth that many people did decide to try to re-enact, re-embody the religious patterns that they thought they remembered from before. So what does it mean then to try to learn to dance in the midst of this earthquake? And what does it have to do with peacemaking? There are two separate questions, you might say, that converge. But let me take up the first one. Six and a half years ago, the Shalom Center, of which I'm the director, a network of American Jews, and to some extent, but at that time, not so much, American Christians and Muslims, very few six and a half years ago, um, drawing on Jewish tradition, both very ancient and very contemporary, to address issues of peace and social justice and the relationship of humanity with the earth, called together a group of Jews, Christians, and Muslims to meet for a long weekend. In fact, we chose, obviously not by accident, the very first anniversary of 9-11 in 2002. The group of people who met began by doing something that was not typical of interfaith meetings. We began by sharing short pieces, 15 minutes worth each, of our spiritual journeys. Most interfaith dialogue, so-called, operates at the level of the head and only the head. This is what I believe, what do you believe? But sharing your spiritual journey means that some of the intellectual stuff gets in there, but the heart, the soul, also get in there. You learn to connect with people at a profound level, at a multi-dimensional level, not a one-dimensional level. And when we had done that, we then did something else, that the unofficial handbooks of interfaith dialogue say never to try to do. Don't try to pray together. It just gets everybody angry. Because if you try to do it in an authentic way of your own tradition, then the other folks feel excluded. And if you try to do it in a way that includes them, then it ain't authentic. So either way, people get angry. We broke the rule. We figured out ways in which Jews could create Jewish services in which Muslims and Christians were invited and included, not just as observers, in which people, Jew, Christians, could create Christian services that were also inclusive and deeply rooted in Christian practice, and Muslims could do the same thing. It wasn't that there were no problems, there were. One of them, not so expected, though maybe if we had planned ahead a little more, we would have expected it, but it wouldn't have made any difference, because it would have ar arisen anyway, was that the men of Islam who led the Muslim services began by not thinking of Muslim women as fully participant in the service. Sure, they're not just observers, but not fully involved in shaping or leading the service. For the Christian and Jewish women who have had now one generation, not more, you understand. So all this triumphalism, oh, Muslims, they treat the women so terribly. One generation difference in Christian and Jewish religious life, only one. The women and the men were uh, shaken, and there were discussions, beginning somewhat tense, but by now with open hearts, because we knew who each other were, and we felt profoundly connected with who each other were. And we moved, everybody moved. Everybody moved to be able to experience Muslim prayer in which women as well as men were able to be leaders, to be full participants, and so could the Christians and the Jews. Amazing. 
And having done that much, we began to talk about action in the world. Those meetings have continued from then till just this past May, and we will be continuing them beyond that. And I think the second one, somebody happened to mention what the date in the Western calendar would be, some Jew mentioned, what the date in the Western calendar would be of Rosh Hashanah in 2005. And one of the Muslims said, really? That's when Ramadan begins. Well, the Jewish and the Muslim calendars are both lunar calendars, but the Jewish one makes, I don't know whether to call it a correction or an uncorrection, every, seven times every 19 years, sticks in an extra lunar month. Notice that lunar month is sort of a repetition. A month is really a month. So even in the English language where months are no longer connected with the moon, we kind of remember a vague echo somewhere in the back of our heads that months are in fact connected with the moon. So the Jewish calendar wobbles and wiggles with the lunar calendar so as to return every several years so the months appear in some solar-connected order. The Muslim calendar pursues the moon and is not terribly interested in what's happening with the sun. So it's not very often that the sacred month of Ramadan and the sacred Jewish month called Tishrei, the month that begins with Rosh Hashanah, includes Yom Kippur, includes the Harvest Festival of Sukkot, turn out to be the same month. In fact, it happens for three years in a row, once a generation. Three years in a row and then not for another 30 years. And here we were about in this moment when by the time we had realized this, the United States was already at war with two Muslim nations and allies of a Jewish state, a self-proclaimed Jewish state, in occupation of another Muslim nation and at war the Muslim nations at war with Israel. In other words, at this moment when Christian and Jewish communities were at, at best on the edge of the precipice and maybe a foot or two over the precipice of war between Islam and the West, we discover this incredible, amazing, miraculous gift of God from God of these confluences in time. And then we discovered, once we started exploring that confluence, a Catholic in the room said, oh, actually, that's interesting. October the 4th, which is the Saint's Day of St. Francis of Assisi, that comes in the middle of that month too. And somebody said, well, okay, I mean, St. Francis is a nice guy, he'd like to talk to birds, but you know, not so important. And she said, no, wait a minute, you don't understand. St. Francis opposed the Crusades. In his generation, in his century, that was like treason and heresy combined. I mean, even more far out than Martin Luther King opposing the Vietnam War. And she added, he spent five months of his life going to study with Muslim scholars in Egypt how to pray and came back to Europe praying, of course, as a Christian, but his prayer transformed by what he had learned from Muslims. So the rest of us said, oh, well, I guess that's part of the miracle too. And then one of the Protestants in the room said, and you know what, the first Sunday in October, Protestant denominations, some of which take communion seriously and some of which not so seriously, have all agreed through the World Council of Churches that the first Sunday in October is Worldwide Communion Sunday. We'll all take it seriously on at least that one Sunday. And that was part of the month too. So we said, oh, talk about miraculous gift, right? So what do we do with it? And what we did was organize from our small group, reaching out to all sorts of folks reaching out to create moments and places all across the United States and even beyond where the three communities would celebrate together, not mushing 
their celebration into a single lowest common denominator event. So that, for example, in Philadelphia, we built a sukkah, the, that kind of weird little hut with a leafy roof, right next to the Liberty Bell. Never been done before. We did that on one of the Sundays of Ramadan. We observed the fast during the day and gathered after sundown to observe iftar, the Muslim breakfast, having celebrated in the sukkah together during the day and, having do, and doing learning, which included learning about St. Francis. So not lowest common denominator, but linking our disparate traditions with each other. And what we also did that day, this is why I said it was going to come back to the global scorching question, we also had the then head of the National Council of Churches, Bob Edyer, and the head of the Islamic Society of North America, Dr. Saeed Saeed, and a leading reform rabbi, come speak together about what each of their traditions approach to dealing with the climate crisis was and could be. So that we brought together around that policy arena questions of how the three great families of Abraham could work together to make a difference in the world. We've continued to meet. The piece of paper I gave, I hope everybody, most of you a yellow sheet. Then when I ran out, we had some two pages stapled together about the confluence. We discovered another confluence. 2506, 2005, 2006, and 2007, it was Ramadan and Tishrei and these Christian festivals that ended. The confluence ended and Ramadan and Tishrei went dancing off in their different directions. And then last May, we discovered another confluence in dates. According to the Constitution, January the 20th, 2009, will be the day of the inauguration of the next President of the United States. According to law, and I doubt that anybody ever figured out this might happen, the Monday, that's the day before January 20th, January 20th is a Tuesday, that Monday, the third Monday of January, is Martin Luther King's birthday. It's not his biological birthday, which is uh, January the 15th, but it's by law, because of this Monday holiday business, it's by law, wow, what does it mean after a moment when all of us, not just a moment, eight years, of what all of us in the tent of Abraham, Hagar, and Sarah, did I say that's when we named ourselves, the tent of Abraham, Hagar, and Sarah, footnote, why the tent? Because there's an oral tradition that Abraham and Hagar and Sarah kept their tent open in all four directions, the flaps all raised, so that they could see travelers coming from anywhere before they actually arrived at the tent and could get ready ahead of time to feed them and give them water, water their camels, etc. This sense of hospitality to all comers. And we thought of our tent as open not only on the three sides of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, but on the fourth side to welcome all the other travelers who were thirsty for peace and hungry for justice. That's why the tent is Abraham, Hagar, and Sarah. We realized that this moment, after eight years of what all of us who happened to be members of that tent, thought were some of the worst eight years of American history, eight years of war, encouraged, pressed, pushed, lied about between not only the United States, but a bunch of other so-called Western nations against several Muslim nations, tippy-toeing, as I said, on the edge of the precipice of an all-out war between Islam and the West. And by the way, I'm not suggesting this is, was urged on or encouraged only by the folks 
In the Western governments, obviously the people who attacked the Twin Towers were also itching for war between Islam and the West. And there were elements in both those communities that would have welcomed, may still welcome, all-out war between Islam and the West. So here we were, and we realized this amazing confluence of dates in January. A new government, we didn't know who would be elected to the presidency or to Congress. A new government coming fully to office the day after Martin Luther King's birthday. The day after one of the great visions rooted in religious tradition and reaching out beyond it with a profoundly different vision of American society. And I don't mean just the I have a dream speech, but where four years later Dr. King had reached on April the 4th, 1967, exactly one year before he was murdered, in the great speech he gave at Riverside Church in New York City, in which he talked about the three triplets haunting, endangering American society, militarism, racism, and materialism. And in which he said, if we don't deal with those in the generation he was speaking to, he was addressing an organization called Clergy and Laity Concerned About Vietnam. He said, if we don't learn to deal with those three now, then a generation from now, there will have to be a clergy and laity concerned about... And he listed half a dozen countries. He didn't list Iraq, but he might as well have. And here we are in that prophecy having become embodied in our laws. He also said in that speech, he also called America to the vision of the world revolution of values in which human beings would be front and center rather than things. And in which loving connections among the peoples of the world would be front and center instead of war. And in which loving understanding between the different racial and ethnic groups of America and of the planet would be front and center instead of racism. The vision of what he called the beloved community. So out of that, we decided on what you have in your hands. To reach out to the religious communities of America, to urge and invite them, us, to study the Riverside Church speech, and then on January the 19th, to gather in synagogues, mosques, churches, temples, other communities of ethic, ethics and religion, to recommit ourselves to that vision that King lifted up. And to recommit ourselves not just to the vision, but to the action in support of the vision as we enter another era of American history. We talked about the notion that just as the president, the new president of the United States, would be about to take an oath of office at noon on January the 20th, so the citizenry should join in a covenantal pledge the day before. And what we are suggesting is that having gathered each community in its own house of worship, having reviewed that pledge on the back or the bottom of what you got, having agreed to it or something like it, there's no way to and no desire to stuff exactly that language down everybody's throat. The language itself comes almost entirely from the Riverside Church speech. That then people would move out that evening, January 19th, from their own religious communities and houses of worship to public space, joining each other in candlelight vigils 
to affirm and publicly assert that covenantal pledge with the hope that surely not the whole of our society, but large parts of it, could in a sense create a contemplative moment, a moment of reflection on the past and the future that we sometimes achieve as individuals and sometimes achieve in our own small religious communities. What could it mean for America to achieve such a moment in a broad swath of our society? So let me invite those of you who feel moved by this call to do something about it, to be in touch with us. I realize the sheets of paper don't, I think, have our, they have one, one of them has one email address on it, tentofabraham at aol.com. So let me suggest that to you, tentofabraham at aol.com, to write there, and we will put you in touch with others who are undertaking this process. And now, finally, let me turn back to another aspect of what we are trying to do. There is profound spiritual reason for the religious communities to seek out each other and to join in celebration of the one that they all not only claim, but practice connection with. There is also in our society serious political reason for Jews, Christians, and Muslims to come together to work together around peacemaking, especially in one chunk of our common planet. Aside from the one of our common climate, and that one chunk is what people call the Middle East, that whole stretch of territory that Abraham, with Sarah, with Hagar, journeyed across from what is now, in fact, Iraq, to what are now Israel and Palestine, and further into Egypt, if you read the biblical story, and further into what is now Saudi Arabia, if you read the Muslim story, where our very depth of emotional connection with those journeys has helped pit us against each other in violence and rage. It's my hypothesis that there are only two <coughs> power centers in American society that care passionately about the Middle East. One is the whole complex of big oil. And the other are Muslims, Jews, and Christians. The question is whether the Muslims, Jews, and Christians can work together on this issue. <coughs> or whether some, enough, of each community can work together on this issue. My experience has been that although a little more than two-thirds of the actual living, breathing American Jews strongly support the emergence of a peaceful Palestine alongside a peaceful Israel and the end of the settlements and the occupation that prevent that from the Israeli side and the end of the sporadic terrorism that prevents it from the Palestinian side. Despite that desire of about two-thirds and more of the American Jewish, as I say, real life breathing Jews, most, not all, but most of the institutional leadership of the Jewish community, even if it mouths that desire, doesn't act to support it. The question is whether that two-thirds of the Jewish community can be mobilized into action together with <laughs> the majority of American Christianity which supports that vision. Not all American Christians do. One of the pieces of, they wish, immovable pre-earthquake reality that some American Christians point to is utter support for every conceivable action of any conceivable Israeli government. 
That's a minority position in American Christian life, but it's there, and it has real political clout. <clears throat> it has certainly had real political clout for the last eight years. And then the third leg of this three-legged stool, American Islam, which is still often fractured according to the country of origin, whether in the United States itself for many African-American Muslims, or the Middle East, or India, or Pakistan, or Indonesia, other sources of Islamic community, and which has not yet formed anything like the strong, vigorous, assertive political action organizations that, for example, American Jews have with about two generations previous older experience. I imagine, I hope for, and more than hope for, act for, the possibility of that three-legged stool coming together. Coming together around a vision of peacemaking across the whole broad territory of the broader so-called Middle East. In my experience, the peace, the peace-oriented Jews feel constantly under threat by the unpeace-seeking official leadership of, as I said, much, not all, of the American Jewish institutional structures. And they need allies. Those progressive and peace-seeking Jews need allies to deal with that constant sniping. My experience is that many, many Christians, especially mainline Protestants, feel awkwardly vulnerable to charges of being anti-Semitic if they criticize actions of the Israeli government, even when they clearly affirm their support for the existence and peace and security of the State of Israel. And my experience is that many American Muslims, at this moment of their history, feel terribly vulnerable to any criticism of the policies of the U.S. government, because to criticize the U.S. government obviously means, if you're Muslim, that you're a traitor. So I think that even at the political level, aside from the spiritual level, Jews who support that peacemaking, and Christians who support it, and Muslims who support it, need to give each other the authority, the, in Yiddish we would say the hechsher, the kosher certification, that it's okay to do this together in dealing with their own communities. So Muslims need support from Christians and Jews to feel safe in pursuing this. And Protestant especially, but maybe also Catholic Christians, need affirmation from a serious part, not just the fringe, of the Jewish community to not be charged with anti-Semitism. And those progressive and peace-seeking Jews need allies to not be constantly under threat and attack from other parts of the Jewish community. So at the political level as well, I think that's necessary. I think this begins with the kinds of connections that the tent of Hagar, of Abraham, Hagar, and Sarah have made. It begins with profound personal connection. It doesn't begin only with agreement to work together on political issue, which can't come without deep trust. And deep trust, I think, rooted in spiritual depth and understanding. But deep spiritual depth and understanding doesn't stop even with praying together even with sharing our spiritual journeys together. All three of our traditions assert that the healing of society, the making of peace, the making of justice, the healing of God's creation, the earth, are part of religious and spiritual lives. And I think that's the arena growing out of the spiritual sharing and the spiritual caring, that's the arena in which we need to be working out how to act together.
So I hope I fulfilled that long and complicated title for my talk, and I welcome discussion and exploration, not just questions, but any kinds of comments, agreement, disagreement, whatever. Yes. Well, I'm old enough to remember what America was like in 1950, let's say. And anybody who would have thought that the legal structures of racial segregation could be dissolved by 1970, I would have seemed utterly ridiculous. Those structures were rooted in law, they were rooted in uh, dominant power, they were rooted in economic um, grasp and greed. The notion, now I'm not suggesting racism in America has disappeared, though I think about a week from today there will, we will wake up with, wow, one big step we must have taken. It won't even have disappeared then. But the legal structures and some of the political structures of domination and economic control that existed in the United States around race in 1950 have in fact vanished. When my kids were growing up in Washington, D.C. in the 1960s, I took them to drugstores and I said to them, now this structure was for whites only. And they said, come on. I mean, look, that couldn't be. I mean, you're making it up, Dad. Because the change was so visible that you couldn't imagine it had ever been any way different. If we think about the changes in the presence of gay men and lesbians in American society, Forget 1950, 1960, 1970, unimaginable. Yet yeah, there it is. Not without struggle, not completely transformed even yet, but in a place so different. So I know what you said about the structures of the hard right in all three of these traditions and their access to power in all the governments that are involved. Absolutely true. And nevertheless, let me tell you a story. This past uh, July, I, 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 of all people, the king of Saudi Arabia, usually understood as the Saudis, I mean, Wahhabi Islam, the tightest, the most right-wing, the most restrictive form of Islam in the world, called together in Madrid a conference not only of Jews, Christians, and Muslims, but of Buddhists and Shintoists and Hindus. Why do I make that distinction? Because in classic Muslim theology, Jews and Christians are people in the book, and more or less monotheists, more or less. Be of them, sure. Buddhists, Shintoists, Hindus, idolaters. The king of Saudi Arabia, actually using his religious title, the guardian of the two sacred places, called together this amazing meeting. Many of his, you might say, orthodox folks at home weren't so happy, but many of them came. And his government came, the entire cabinet of Saudi Arabia came and Pakistani Muslims, people who had, A, never met a Jew in their lives, and some of them probably never met a Christian in their lives, 
and B, didn't even know there were such people in the world as Jews who both supported the existence of the state of Israel and thought that the occupation was an abomination. What? How do you get those two ideas together in your head? They, well, we were, there were 25 or more Jews there, some of them rabbis, some of them other leaders of the Jewish communities of Europe, North America, Latin America, and Israel, who did hold those views together in their head, who were utterly serious about Judaism. I think every one of them serious about the state of Israel and its wistful desire to act like a Jewish state. And nevertheless, or therefore, not nevertheless, therefore, thought the occupation was abominable. We met people who we would never have met. They met people who they never would have met. The king went out of his way to affirm how important it was for Islam to see itself as a religion of dialogue with all the religious traditions. They didn't just invite them. Now, was it all peaches and cream? Absolutely not. When we arrived, they handed out the program for the five days, I think, and there were five um, plenary sessions scheduled with speakers at every one of those plenary sessions, five speakers at each one, and every single one of those 25 people was a man. Well, some of us publicly and some of us privately said, please, this doesn't go. I was one of the people who said it both privately and publicly. And what I was told privately was, I mean, there wasn't an answer publicly, at first, but privately I was thought, well, you know, of course, but after all, it's Saudi and they're not used to it and it'll take years before they get it uh, fully understood and, you know, we're just going to have to live through this conference in Madrid and keep raising the question. The next morning, at the beginning of one of the plenary sessions, the moderator for that session said, there have been a number of questions raised here by members of the community of this conference, and as a result of these, we wish to announce a change in the presenters at this plenary session. And one of the pl uh, uh, presenters will be a woman Muslim scholar living in Madrid in place of one of the men who had been scheduled. And then she presented her paper. Now, do you think her paper was like a patsy for, well, you know, you just got... Her paper, based on her own research, what said, affirmed, its whole focus was that interreligious dialogue requires the full involvement of women. Now, is it all dissolved? You know, is, has Saudi Arabia totally transformed its society? For sure not. Has something begun to cook? Absolutely. So, having lived through that, oh, and I must say, aside from the plenary sessions, which, like in most conferences, were mostly pretty boring, except for that one, breakfast, lunch, and dinner was not boring. As we sat with each other, talked with each other, discovered each other, uncovered each other, that was not boring. And, pro and I'm sure the most important aspect of the conference, it is at many conferences, but in this one, absolutely. The meals were interesting even in themselves as meals, right? Spanish cuisine, we were meeting at a big Spanish hotel. Spanish cuisine is chock full of pork and ham. You almost can't eat anything in Spain if you don't eat pork and ham. So the hotel had laid out the food, and what do you know? They had little labels, pork, ham, halal, and kosher meals available for those who weren't of us who weren't willing simply to eat fresh fruit and vegetables and fish. They made a whole big point about it being Spain, where for several centuries Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived in peace with each other, and more than at peace, in joyful conversation with each other. The king of Spain spoke as well as the king of Saudi Arabia. Nobody until the third day mentioned the um, dirty truth that those three centuries were ended in 1492 with the expulsion of both Jews and Muslims from newly Catholic Spain. Everybody looked. 
Till finally a Muslim from um, Sarajevo said, now in Sarajevo we are very proud that in 1492 Jews and Muslims thrown out of Spain came Ooh. the dirty truth spoken aloud. There were amazing moments. That was in a plenary session, right? The amazing moments like that through this whole thing. So it ain't over for sure. The rigidities, the fears, the anger, the rage. I, two weeks ago, I sat myself down to watch this DVD called Obsession, uh, a poisonous attack on Islam as a whole, which starts out with pictures of exploding buildings, exploding buses and airplanes and burning flags and so on. And over the burn, burning stuff, which totally obsess, obsesses actually your vision, were printed words saying, this film is not about Islam as a whole, but only about uh, militant or radical, something like that, Islam. But I found myself, I mean, one thing to be able to read those words, I could barely read them because of what was going on in the pictures in the DVD. And by the middle of the DVD, they stopped talking about radical Islam. They just talked about Islam, said all the same things. Um, interestingly, as bad as it was to make such a film and circulate it, it was paid for millions of dollars, paid for it to put millions of copies, insert into a whole bunch of daily American newspapers and sent around. But even more interesting, the papers that were chosen with the exception of the New York Times, with a national audience, all the papers that were chosen were papers in, quote, swing states, unquote, in the presidential election. Clearly a kind of sub rosa effect to affect the uh, attempt to affect the election uh, by raising fear and rage against Islam. Well, so that's there too. And when Colin, um, what's his name, Powell, said, well, people keep saying that um, Obama's a Muslim. That's not true. He's a Christian, has been all his life. And then added, and what if he were? In America, is it not allowed to be a Muslim, not allowed to be a presidential candidate if you're a Muslim? He said, that's not America. Well, unfortunately, he's not exactly correct, right? That is, there is part of America in which that, and that's America too. And there is also the America of all the versions of the tent of Abraham, Hagar, and Sarah, all the people who responded to 9-11, Christians and Jews, by going to protect mosques against people who wanted to attack them. That's also America. And we will have to decide what's America. It's not clear yet what America is. Well, a whole bunch of questions there, but I'll try to answer most, if not all of them. First of all, how do I view it? Sadly. Secondly, how do I view it? Analytically. So, for example, it is in fact true that Hamas did not, in fact, get the majority of the votes of the Palestinians. The reason that they won a sizable majority of the Palestinian um, assembly was that Fatah broke into two factions. And it's as if the Democratic Party had broken into two factions, but the Republican Party had stayed united. And everywhere in America where there were elections for Congress, 
the Republicans would have won with pluralities, even though... So people who say, oh, the Palestinian people committed itself to an organization and an ideology that totally rejects the state of Israel, ain't true. Third, analysis of why Hamas got as big a vote as it did. The Israeli government had refused to negotiate in any serious way with the Fatah-led um, elected government of Palestine, of Palestine, had refused, for example, to negotiate a withdrawal from Gaza instead of doing it on its own. And doing it on its own with no concern for what the Palestinian issues and interests and how to go about it were. It rejected, it treated as illegitimate and not interesting, not interesting in a powerful way, the government of the Palestinians before the election. There was pretty universal agreement among everybody involved that that government was shot through and through and Fatah was shot through and through with corruption. So if you were Palestinian, you had a couple of choices. You could vote for a corrupt government that the Israelis wouldn't negotiate with, or you could vote for, with, also everybody agrees, uh, Hamas is not corrupt. You could vote for a non-corrupt political party that wouldn't negotiate with the Israelis and the Israelis wouldn't negotiate with. So either way, your choice was you weren't going to get negotiation with Israel. You could maybe get a, a, you could get a corrupt government or you could get an uncorrupt government. Even then, Hamas did not win a majority of the Palestinian votes, though they did have a majority of the uh, public uh, opinion of Gaza. But in Palestine as a whole, they didn't. Well, given that choice, it's not surprising to me, unfortunate, sad, maybe I would have urged people to vote for a corrupt government that maybe, maybe, the Israelis might decide to negotiate with, but it doesn't surprise me much that people where no negotiation was being offered would vote for the uncorrupt political party. Some of them vote for that, about 40%. Um, what to do about it? Sorry, yeah. Don't mean to interrupt at all. Um, I would encourage anyone who has other questions. Um, <laughs> sorry. I specialize in giving long answers to short questions. <laughs> no, okay. I'm sorry. Right, okay. So, the last question you asked, given this hostility to Israel, how could the occupation end? I'm sorry, but I think the question is upside down. That is, how can you expect there to stop being rage against Israel as long as the occupation continues? That doesn't mean that there's no negotiating process involved. It doesn't mean that you have to go in all one way without any possibility the other way. It me does mean that you have to move, and in fact, with all the public statements, no negotiation with Hamas whatsoever, turned out the Israeli government, probably using the Egyptians as in-betweens, did in fact negotiate a ceasefire with Hamas. A ceasefire which has worked, 99%. The rockets are not falling on Sderot. And Israeli uh, gunships are not shooting down Palestinian leaders. For months now, there has been a ceasefire, even though, on the one hand, Hamas says, shouldn't be such a state altogether. And the Israelis are saying, never any negotiations with this terrorist organization. Somehow, they worked out a way to talk with each other so that people are not getting killed. Neither Israelis nor Palestinians. The killing level has radically declined. That's a beginning. It's not enough, but it's a beginning. And it says to me, it doesn't work to say, we will not have any negotiation. We will not figure out how to end the occupation as long as there's anybody saying, ah, you don't belong to exist. Both sides need to change. But neither side will change as long as the other one, and I mean neither side, will change as long as the other one is totally rigid. The last thing I guess I want to say is 
So people mostly talk about negotiations as if they're a kind of political issue. I think negotiations are a spiritual issue. What are negotiations? Real ones. My friend and teacher, Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalom, he says, what is a circle dance? And why is a circle dance a good thing? The reason a circle dance is a good thing is because everybody in the circle gets to dance in everybody else's place. You get to see the world the way everybody else in the circle gets to see the world. So take this out of the, you know, literal physical sense. What a real negotiation is, is learning to see the world through the other person's eyes. That doesn't mean you have to do exactly what the other person says. But you do have to learn why the other party sees the world that way and figure out if you can meet the absolute needs of the other party without giving up your own absolute needs. What are the gray areas? What is the ground on which both of us need to dance knowing that I under, need to understand what it means to be you in this dance? So in that sense, negotiation is deep, deep, deep rooted in what all of us claim, which is that there was one ground. There is one reality. There is one divine truth, sacred truth in the world. And we need to learn to see each other's perspectives. There's no way for that one truth to be represented by a single version of reality. A divine infinity can only be reflected in human diversity. And we need to understand both aspects, the unity and the diversity. We need to understand they are not opposites. They are absolutely intrinsically rooted in each other. Thanks.